Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to Lesson 11 from the series on Genesis. It's titled Joseph, Master of Dreams, and is ready for teaching on June 11. And I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 4. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we just thank you that your word speaks to us and that we can hear it as it's read. And particularly today I'd like to pray for the thousands who are listening through Christian record services out of Lincoln, Nebraska in the North American Division. Those who are blind, those who are vision impaired who receive this service. I just want to thank you that they can receive this and that it can open our eyes eyes and our hearts and our minds to what your word is talking to us about. I'd also like to pray for those who are visually impaired and blind in Germany who who are listening to this through Hope Channel and those listening through the Blind Low Vision New Zealand uh, service uh, in New Zealand and for those who are listening through Christian services for the blind and hearing impaired and Vision Australia in Australia. But around the world, Lord, there are people who are listening uh, on the podcast, they're listening on the YouTube version, and I pray that each of us who are listening will be blessed by your word this week as we look at the story of Joseph. We pray that not only will we remember the story of the multicoloured coat, but that we will remember the story of Joseph's interaction with you and the lessons we can learn from there. Bless us and may your Holy Spirit be with each one of us. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 37 and verse 19. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Let's read that again. Genesis 37 verse 19. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. The story of Joseph in Genesis chapters 37 to 50 covers the last section of the book of Genesis, from his first dreams in Canaan in chapter 37 to his death in Egypt in chapter 50. In fact, Joseph occupies more space in the book of Genesis than does any other patriarch. Although Joseph is just one of Jacob's sons, he is presented in Genesis as a great patriarch like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. As we will see too, the life of Joseph highlights two important theological truths. First, God fulfills his promises. Second, God can turn evil into good. In this week's study, we will focus on the early life of Joseph. He is Jacob's favourite son, who is ironically nicknamed Baal Hak Alomot, the dreamer in Genesis 37 verse 19, which we'll see later on uh, this week, which means literally master of dreams, implying that he is an expert of dreams. This title fits him very well because he not only receives, understands and interprets prophetic dreams, but he also fulfills them in his life as well. In these chapters, we will see again that God's providence is affirmed despite the evil and wickedness of the human heart. Sunday, June 5, Family Troubles Jacob has at last settled in the land. While Isaac was only a stranger, the text also says that Jacob dwelt in the land in verse 1 of chapter 37. Yet it was then, as he was settling into the land, that the troubles began, this time from inside the family. The controversy does not concern the possession of the land or the use of a well. It is mainly spiritual. Read Genesis chapter 37 verses 1 to 11. What family dynamic predisposed Joseph's brothers to hate him so much? Genesis 37 beginning at verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. 
Joseph, being seventeen years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhar and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colours. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him, even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. From the very beginning, we understand that Joseph, the son of Jacob's old age, as we read in verse 3, enjoyed a special relationship with his father, who loved him more than all his brothers, verse 4. Jacob even went so far as to make Joseph a tunic of many colours, we read in verse 3, a prince's garment, which we read about in Second Samuel chapter 13 and verse 11. Now she had on a robe of many colours, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel, and his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her, an indication of Jacob's secret intention to elevate Joseph, Rachel's first son, to the status of firstborn. The future will indeed confirm Jacob's wishes because Joseph eventually will receive the rights of the firstborn. We read about those in 1 Chronicles 5 too. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. No wonder then that Joseph's brothers hated him so much and could not even engage in peaceful conversation with him, as we read in chapter 37 of Genesis and verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Furthermore, Joseph would bring bad reports to his father about any reprehensible behaviour from his brothers. We read that in verse 2. No one likes a snitch. So when Joseph shared his dreams, suggesting that God would put him in a higher position and that they, his brothers, would bow down before him, they hated him even more. The genuine prophetic character of the dreams was even ratified by the fact that they are repeated in Genesis 41 verse 32. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Although Jacob openly rebuked his son in verse 10 of chapter 37, so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? He kept this incident in his mind, meditating on its meaning and waiting for its fulfilment, which we read in verse 11, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. The implication is that, perhaps, deep down he thought there might be something to those dreams after all. He was right, however much he couldn't know it at the time. And so to finish today, read Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. What crucial principle is revealed here? And how can we learn to manifest in our own lives what it teaches? 
Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant, and whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. June 6. The Attack on Joseph However horrible the events that were to follow, they're not hard to comprehend. To be in that close proximity to, and even to be related to, someone whom you hated would inevitably lead, sooner or later, only to trouble. And it did. Read Genesis chapter 37, verses 12 to 36. What does this teach us about how dangerous and evil unregenerate hearts can be, and what they can lead any one of us to do? Genesis 37, beginning at verse 12, Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, Here I am. Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dream is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, Some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands, and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colours that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes, and he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colours, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognised it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. 
The brothers hate Joseph because they are jealous of God's favour, a favour that will be confirmed at each step in the next course of events. Acts chapter 7 verse 9 reads, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. When Joseph has lost his way, a man finds him and guides him, as we read in verse 15. Now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? When Joseph's brothers plot to kill him, Reuben intervenes and suggests that he be thrown into a pit instead. We read that in verses 20 to 22. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we shall say, Some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. It's hard to imagine the kind of hatred expressed here, especially for someone of their own household. How could these young men have done something so cruel? Did they not think, even for a few moments, about how this would impact their own father? Whatever resentment they might have had toward their father because he favoured Joseph, to do this to one of his children was truly despicable. What a powerful manifestation of just how evil human beings can be, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 211, but some of them, the brothers, were ill at ease. They did not feel the satisfaction they had anticipated from their revenge. Soon a company of travellers was seen approaching. It was a caravan of Ishmaelites from beyond Jordan, on their way to Egypt with spices and other merchandise. Judah now proposed to sell his brother to these heathen traders instead of leaving him to die. While he would be effectively put out of their way, they would remain clear of his blood. End of quote. After they cast him into the pit, planning to kill him later, a caravan passes and Judah proposes to his brothers to sell Joseph to them. We read in verses 26 and 27. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. After Joseph is sold to the Midianites, in verse 28, then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. The Midianites sell him to someone in Egypt, we read in verse 36. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard, thus anticipating his future glory. And so to finish the day, why is it so important to seek God's power in order to change bad traits of character before they can manifest themselves in acts that, at one point in your life, you would never have imagined yourself doing? Tuesday, June 7. Judah and Tamar. The story of Tamar is not out of place here. This incident follows chronologically the sale of Joseph in Egypt, and it is consistent with the fact that Judah has just left his brothers, which points to his disagreement with them. In addition, the text shares a number of common words and motifs with the preceding chapter, and it carries the same theological lesson. An evil act will be turned into a positive event linked to salvation. Read Genesis chapter 38. Compare Judah's behaviour with that of the Canaanite Tamar, who of the two is more righteous, and why? 
Genesis chapter 38, beginning at verse 1. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adullamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son, and called his name Shelah. He was at Chezib when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Ur his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his, and it came to pass, when he went into his brother's wife, that he omitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Therefore he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear the sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So she said, Will you give me a pledge till you send it? Then he said, What pledge shall I give you? So she said, Your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he gave them to her, and went into her, and she conceived by him. So she arose, and went away, and laid aside her veil, and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend the Adullamites, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he did not find her. Then he asked the men at that place, saying, Where is the harlot who was openly by the roadside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also the men of the place said, There was no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, Let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. And it came to pass, about three months after, that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these things belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Shelah my son, and he never knew her again. Now it came to pass, at the time of giving birth, that, behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was, when she was giving birth, that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. Then it happened, as he drew back his hand, that his brother came out unexpectedly. And she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Judah finds a Canaanite wife. We read in verse 2. Let's just read that again. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he married her and went in to her, with whom he had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Judah gives the Canaanite Tamar as wife to Ur. 
his firstborn in order to ensure proper genealogy. When Ur and Onan are killed by God because of their wickedness, Judah promises his last son, Shelah, to Tamar. When, after some time, Judah seems to have forgotten his promise as he goes to comfort himself after the death of his wife, Tamar decides to play the prostitute in order to force him to fulfil his promise. Because Judah has no cash to pay the prostitute, whom he does not recognise, he promises to send her later a goat from his flock. Tamar requires that, in the meantime, he give her his signet and cord and his staff as an immediate guarantee of payment. Tamar will get pregnant from this unique encounter. When later accused of playing the harlot, she will show to the accuser Judah his signet and cord and his staff. Judah understands and apologises. The conclusion of this sordid story is the birth of Perez, meaning breaking through, who, like Jacob, is born second and becomes first and is named in salvation history as the ancestor of David, as we read in Ruth chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab. Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. And ultimately, of Jesus Christ, as we read in Matthew 1, verse 3. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. As for Tamar, she is the first of the four women, followed by Rahab. We read about her in Matthew chapter five, chapter one and verse five. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse. And then there's Ruth. We read about her in verse 5 and 6 again. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. And the wife of Uriah, we read in verse 6. David the king begot Solomon by her, who had been the wife of Uriah who genealogically preceded Mary, the mother of Jesus, as you read in verse 16 of Matthew 1. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. One lesson we can take from this story, just as God saved Tamar through his grace, transforming evil into good, so will he save his people through the cross of Jesus. And in the case of Joseph, he will turn his troubles into the salvation of Jacob and his sons. Wednesday, June 8. Joseph, a slave in Egypt. We now pick up the flow of Joseph's stories, which have been interrupted by the Tamar incident. Joseph is now working as a slave for the captain of the guard, who is in charge of the prison for royal officials. Let's have a look at that in Genesis 40, verses 3 and 4. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. And verses 10 to 12, When Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. Read Genesis chapter 39. In light of the example of Joseph's working as a manager under Potiphar, what are the factors that led to such success? Genesis 
Chapter 39, beginning at verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord is with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favour in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was, from the time that he had made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her, to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time, when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and fled and ran outside. And so it was, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house, and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened, when he heard that I lifted my voice, and cried out, that he left his garment with me, and fled, and went outside. So... She kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was, when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Almost immediately, Joseph was characterised as a man of success, as we read in Genesis 39, 2 and 3. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. He was so good, and his master so trusted him, that all that he had he put into his hand. And Potiphar even made him overseer over his house, we read in verse 4. Joseph's success, however, does not corrupt him. When Potiphar's wife notices him and wants to sleep with him, Joseph unambiguously refuses and prefers to lose his job and his security, rather than, as it says in verse 9, do this great wickedness and sin against God. The woman, humiliated by Joseph's refusal, reports falsely to her servants and to her husband that Joseph wanted to rape her. As a result, Joseph is cast into prison. Joseph experiences here what we all have experienced, the sense of abandonment by God, though even in this difficult time, as it said in verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. Eventually, the Lord acts, and it has an impact on Joseph's relationship with the officer of the prison. Here too, as in his master's house, the Lord blesses Joseph. 
He obviously is a gifted man, and despite even worse circumstances now, after all, before he was still a slave, he seeks to make the best of it. Whatever his gifts, however, the text makes it clear that in the end it was only God who brought him success. Verse 23. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. How important that all who are gifted, all who are successful, remember where it all comes from. And to finish today, read Genesis 39, verses 7 to 12. How did Joseph resist the advances of Potiphar's wife? Why did Joseph specifically say that to do what she asked would be a sin against God? What understanding does he show of the nature of sin and what it is? Genesis 39, beginning at verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time, when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Thursday, June 9. The Dreams of Pharaoh. Read Genesis chapter 40, verse 1, to chapter 41, verse 36. How are the dreams of Pharaoh related to the dreams of the officers? What is the significance of this parallel? Let's begin reading at Genesis chapter 40 and verse 1. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so that they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came in to them in the morning and looked at them and said that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now, within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and there were three white baskets on my head. 
In the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And chapter 41. Then it came to pass, at the end of two full years, that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly, gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then, behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke, also I saw in my dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one, and the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine.' 
This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe." And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming, and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. The providential character of the events continues. Over time, Joseph is put in charge of the prisoners, two of whom happen to be former officers of Pharaoh, a butler and a baker. We read about that in chapter 41, verses 9 to 11. They are both troubled by dreams that they cannot understand, because, as it says in verse 8 of chapter 40, there is no interpreter. Joseph then interprets their respective dreams. In a parallel to the two officers' dreams, Pharaoh also has two dreams which no one can interpret, and that's recorded in Genesis 41 verses 1 to 8. At that moment, the butler providentially remembers Joseph and recommends him to Pharaoh in verses 9 to 13. In a parallel to the other dreams, Pharaoh, like the officers, is troubled and, like them, reveals his dreams in verses 14 to 24 and Joseph interprets them. Like the officers' dreams, Pharaoh's dreams display parallels of symbols, the two series of seven cows, fat and gaunt, just as the two series of heads of grain, plump and thin, represent two series of years, one good and one bad. The seven cows parallel the seven heads of grain, repeating the same message, an evidence of their divine origin, just like Joseph's dreams. As we read in chapter 41, verse 32, And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. And we compare that with Genesis 37 and verse 9. Then he dreamed still another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Though Joseph is the one who interpreted the dream for Pharaoh, Joseph makes certain that Pharaoh knows that it was God, Elohim, who showed the king the things that he, God, was going to do. As we read in chapter 41, verse 25, Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. And he repeats this in verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. It seems, too, that Pharaoh got the message because when he decided to appoint someone to be over the land, his argument was as follows in verses 39 and 40. Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. How fascinating. Thanks to God, Joseph goes from ruler over Potiphar's house, to ruler over the prison, to ruler over all of Egypt. What a powerful story about how, even amid what look like terrible circumstances, God's providences are revealed. And so to finish the day, how can we learn to trust God and cling to his promises when events don't appear providential at all, and indeed God seems silent?
Friday, June 10. From the book Education, written by Ellen G. White, pages 51 and 52, we read, In early life, just as they were passing from youth to manhood, Joseph and Daniel were separated from their homes and carried as captives to heathen lands. Especially was Joseph subject to the temptations that attend great changes of fortune. In his father's home, a tenderly cherished child. In the house of Potiphar, a slave. Then, a confidant and a companion. A man of affairs, educated by study, observation, contact with men. In Pharaoh's dungeon, a prisoner of state. Condemned unjustly, without hope of vindication or prospect of release. Called at a great crisis to the leadership of the nation. What enabled him to preserve his integrity? In his childhood, Joseph had been taught the love and fear of God. Often in his father's tent under the Syrian stars, he had been told the story of the night vision at Bethel, of the ladder from heaven to earth, and of the descending and ascending angels, and of him who from the throne above revealed himself to Jacob. He had been told the story of the conflict beside the Jabbok, when, renouncing cherished sins, Jacob stood conqueror and received the title of a prince with God. A shepherd boy tending his father's flocks, Joseph's pure and simple life had favoured the development of both physical and mental power. By communion with God through nature and the study of the great truths handed down as a sacred trust from father to son, he had gained strength of mind and firmness of principle. In the crisis of his life, when making that terrible journey from his childhood home in Canaan to the bondage which awaited him in Egypt, looking for the last time on the hills that hid the tents of his kindred, Joseph remembered his father's God. He remembered the lessons of his childhood, and his soul thrilled with the resolve to prove himself true, even to act as became a subject of the King of Heaven. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, compare Joseph with Daniel and Jesus. What are their common points? How did Joseph and Daniel, in their own ways, reveal aspects of what Jesus would be like? And two, talk about the question at the end of Thursday's study. How do we learn to trust God when things don't turn out as well for us as they did eventually for Joseph? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled An Eternal Gift and it's by Andrew McChesney. Tragedy struck young Vashalini's life when her parents divorced over a misunderstanding in the extended family. Vishalini sadly said goodbye to mother after father gained custody of her. Before long, father remarried and Vishalini had a stepmother. Vishalini felt so alone. Her new stepmother did not like mother at all. Vishalini deeply loved mother and she looked forward to her occasional visits. The girl would smile and give mother a big hug. Mother also smiled and gave Vishalini a big hug. Mother often had something else for the girl as well. She brought gifts. Here is something for you, mother would say, pressing tasty treats into her little hand. Vishalini smiled happily. She liked gifts and she liked tasty treats. But before she could eat them, her stepmother often snatched them away. You are not allowed to accept any of her gifts, her stepmother said sharply. Vishalini felt so alone. She grew up into a teenager and father sent her away to study at a boarding school in another part of Tamil Nadu state. It was scary to leave home for the first time, but Vishalini was glad to be away from family tensions and to be among friendly children and teachers. As the weeks passed, she became especially interested in hearing about someone whom the children called the real God. She wanted to know more and she began to learn about Jesus. Today, 
Vishalini calls Jesus her friend and says she will never feel alone again. Why? Because Jesus has promised, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, in Matthew 28, verse 20. Vishalini has one gift that no one can ever take away. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering that helped construct a new girls' dormitory at Vishalini's school, James Memorial Higher Secondary School in Tamil Nadu State in southeastern India. The new dormitory allowed Vashalini and the other girls to move out of a dilapidated building that no longer was a healthy place to live. And there's a beautiful photo of Vashalini here with her smile and long plaits. This mission story illustrates the following components of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. Mission objective number two, to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach in large cities across the 1040 window among unreached and underreached people groups and to non-Christian religions. Mission objective number three, to make developing resources for Mission to non-Christian religions and belief systems a high priority and spiritual growth objective number seven to help youth and young adults place God first and exemplify a biblical world view. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.